This lecture, Wealth and Its Role in Human Life, was delivered in the fall of 1994 at the Jefferson School Seminars in Los Angeles and New York City. It had previously been delivered in August of 1991 as part of the Jefferson School Summer Conference held on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. It was part of a six-lecture series on the subject of wealth, natural resources, and the environment, and the political concept of monopoly. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Economics is the science that studies the production of wealth under a system of division of labor. That is, a system in which the individual lives by producing or helping to produce just one or at most a very few things and is supplied by the labor of others with practically everything that he himself consumes. Capitalism, with its private ownership of the means of production, the profit motive, the freedom of competition, and the price system, is the essential requirement for the successful functioning of a division of labor society, indeed, ultimately, for its very existence. Now, these are leading propositions which many of you have heard me develop at one or more other uh, TJS seminars or conferences, and whose elaboration, at least in part, you may have read in my book, The Government Against the Economy. It's implicit in these propositions that the ultimate source of the importance of the division of labor and capitalism and of the science of economics is wealth. This is because, in the last analysis, the division of labor, capitalism, and the science of economics are all merely means to the production of wealth. The subject of wealth and the relationship of economics to wealth is surrounded with confusion. There is confusion over the meaning of wealth, doubt even over whether economics is a science of wealth, and above all, confusion and doubt concerning the importance of wealth, that is, concerning its proper role in human life. Indeed, most philosophers and religious thinkers have held that the production of wealth serves only a low order of needs of secondary importance, and that concern with its production, beyond the minimum necessities required for the sustenance of human life, is evil, immoral, and sinful by virtue of elevating low material values to the place properly reserved only for the pursuit of noble spiritual values. If these beliefs were correct, then economics would at best be a science of secondary importance, and preoccupation with it by serious thinkers would be a mark of perversity. In the face of such attitudes and confusions, it is incumbent upon economics to clarify matters, that is, to explain what wealth is, why economics is in fact a science of wealth, and above all, to justify itself by providing philosophical validation for the production of wealth being a central, continuing concern of human existence. In other words, economics must explain the role of wealth in human life beyond that of the food, clothing, and shelter required for immediate sustenance, and show how the continuing rise in the productivity of labor, made possible by the division of labor and capitalism, serves objectively demonstrable human needs. It must show, indeed, why there is no practical limit to man's need for wealth. Only on the basis of an objectively demonstrable need for wealth without limit is there a full and secure foundation for the need for the division of labor and capitalism and the continuous economic progress they bring, and thus for the science of economics. The absence of such understanding has been a major precondition of the success of all efforts and movements seeking to limit the individual's acquisition of wealth from sumptuary laws to progressive income taxation to socialism and, most recently, to environmentalism. Thus, I will turn now to an explanation of what wealth is, why economics is the science of wealth, or a science of wealth, and why there is an objectively demonstrable human need for wealth without limit. Wealth is material goods made by man. It is houses and automobiles, piles of lumber and bars of copper, 
steel mills and pipelines, foodstuffs and clothing. It is also land and natural resources in the ground, insofar as man has made them usable and accessible. Man, of course, does not make the material stuff of land and natural resources, but he certainly does create their character as wealth. <clears throat> Atmospheric air, sunlight, rainfall, and wind are also material goods. But insofar as they come to us automatically, without any need for labor or effort on our part to cause their existence or our benefit from them, they are outside the province of economic activity and of economics. They are free goods, that is, nature-given conditions that automatically benefit us. Economics deals only with those goods which are the object of economic activity, that is, which man needs to produce in some sense, goods whose existence or beneficial relationship to his well-being he needs to cause in his capacity as a thinking being, that is, on whose behalf he must expend labor. Such goods are economic goods. In saying that wealth is goods, I refer only to economic goods. I exclude free goods. <clears throat> Some implications of the fact <clears throat> that wealth consists of goods must be named. <clears throat> wealth is not at all synonymous with money or monetary value. The wealth produced in an economic system and the total monetary value of that wealth are separate and distinct phenomena. The one can increase without the other. More wealth can exist totally apart from more money. More wealth produced in the form of ordinary commodities like steel, sugar, automobiles, and so on, without any increase in the supply of money, is nonetheless more wealth. But in such circumstances, it results in correspondingly lower prices and no increase in the total monetary value of commodities. By the same token, more money and more monetary value can exist totally apart from more wealth. This happens almost every day under a system of fiat paper money, where the supply of money is determined by the wishes of the government, irrespective of the supply of goods. In such circumstances, the effect of the additional money is simply to raise prices. <clears throat> In reality, I'd like to point out, all, popular, all the popular measures of the production of wealth expressed in terms of totals of money, such as gross national product or now gross domestic product, are fundamentally nothing but indicators of the quantity of money, not the physical volume of goods produced. That is, their increase is caused essentially just by the increase in the quantity of money and volume of spending in the economic system not by the increase in the production and supply of actual physical goods. Stocks, bonds, and bank deposits are also not wealth. They are claims to wealth, to the plant and equipment and inventories of the firms issuing the stocks or bonds, or borrowing from the banks, or to the houses or automobiles of the consumers who have borrowed. The meaning of wealth depends on the meaning of goods. Following Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian School of Economics, I define goods as things which are recognized as capable of satisfying human needs, for which labor or effort must be expended, and over which one has sufficient command gainfully to direct them to the satisfaction of one's needs. Uh, Menger, I have to point out, did not think it necessary to include the qualification gainfully in his discussion of sufficient command over things. In other words, goods are things actually capable of benefiting us, that is, of doing us personal good. Our wealth is the collection of material things which we possess or against which we hold enforceable claims. Stocks, bonds, and bank deposits, of course, are such claims. Things which have the power to satisfy our needs, but which we do not recognize as possessing that power, are not goods and do not form part of our wealth. For example, before the second half of the 19th century, petroleum was not a good. 
before the 20th century, uranium was not a good. People did not know the beneficial properties of petroleum or uranium, and thus did not know how to use them for anything. Thus, at the time, such things could do them no actual good, and were therefore not goods and not part of wealth. The only circumstance in which a thing could do us good without our being aware of its beneficial properties, and thus without our having to take action based on such awareness, would be if its benefit came to us automatically, that is, if it were a free good. For a thing to be an economic good, it is essential that we possess awareness of its beneficial properties. Only then will we take the action required to actually derive good from them. In the same way, even if technological knowledge exists concerning the usefulness of a given type of mineral, let us say, all of the specific deposits of the mineral, which are as yet undiscovered, are not goods and do not constitute wealth. They too can do us no actual good in such a case. Further, things are not goods and do not constitute wealth, whose useful properties and specific locations are known, but over which we lack sufficient command to direct them to the satisfaction of our needs. For example, iron on Mars, or even 50 miles down in the Earth, is not a good and not wealth, even if we are aware of its specific location, given our present inability to gain access to it. By the same token, water in the United States is not a good to someone wandering in the Sahara. Manufactured products, too, are not goods to those who have no knowledge of their existence or cannot gain access to them. Finally, things are not goods and do not constitute wealth, even if their useful properties and specific locations are known, and even if we have sufficient command over them to direct them to the satisfaction of our needs, if we cannot gainfully direct them to the satisfaction of our needs. One clear illustration of that would be if in the next 50 years we succeed in sending a spaceship to Mars and it might return with a few kilograms of iron ore from Mars, uh, this would not be a process of wealth production. You'd be uh, spending uh, billions of dollars for the spaceship to get a few dollars of iron ore. This would not be a gainful process. Uh, another example, uh, there are vast stretches of land in the United States which could be used to grow crops if someone decided to do so, but uh, they are not actually goods and not wealth because their potential could be exploited only by withdrawing capital and labor from other employments where the product of the capital and labor is greater. The use of such land to grow crops would thus not, our, not achieve our actual good, all things considered, but would inflict a loss in reducing the output of our capital and labor. In other words, if we drew people off of uh, the land in Indiana and Illinois and brought them out to Nevada uh, to grow crops at the, after we had uh, thoroughly transformed the soil there, that would not be a wealth creating process. It would entail uh, a loss of wealth. Well, thus such land does not constitute a good and is not part of wealth. It is possible, of course, that such things presently not goods could someday become goods and thus wealth, if, for example, the costs of exploiting them could be reduced, or if a growing population provided labor and capital that had no better alternatives to which to be applied. To some extent, such things may be valued as goods and count as wealth in the present in anticipation of their being able to accomplish actual good in the future. Just as the beneficial properties of things can fail to be recognized, it sometimes happens that beneficial properties are ascribed to things which do not in fact possess them, such as the beneficial properties some people ascribe to rabbit's feet, tarot cards, and so on. We can join with Menger in describing, in characterizing such things as imaginary goods. It's not necessary, however, for economics to devote any special consideration to such goods beyond acknowledging the fact of their existence. This is both because they constitute unimportant exceptions and because most of the economic principles that apply to such goods, such as the laws of price determination, are the same as those that apply to genuine goods. Again, following Menger, 
we can divide goods into various orders corresponding to their closeness to or remoteness from the satisfaction of our needs and wants. Goods that stand in a direct causal relationship to the satisfaction of our needs and wants can be described as goods of the first order. These are the things that benefit us directly and are therefore directly good. For example, the food we eat, the clothes we wear. Those goods, in turn, that are necessary to the production of goods of the first order can be described as goods of the second order. For example, the ingredients and implements required to prepare a meal, the cloth, sewing machines, and thread required to produce clothes. Similarly, those goods that are necessary to the production of the goods of the second order can be described as goods of the third order, and so on. The advantage of this terminology is that it highlights the fact that the source of the goods character of things is ultimately within us. Goods derive their character as goods by virtue of their ability to benefit human beings. Goods character radiates outward from people to things and touches first those things which we, char we, which we categorize as goods of the first order second, those which we categorize as goods of the, of the second order, and so on. So it starts with us and uh, proceeds step by step to things more and more remote. It should be apparent that the concept of economic goods is fully consistent with Ayn Rand's description of the good philosophically as an aspect of reality in relation to men. The fact that economics is a science of wealth was taken for granted by the classical economists in the 19th century. Economics' focus on wealth has been challenged in the 20th century, however, and a large majority of economists today downplays the special importance of wealth in the subject. Uh, one challenge is constituted by the frequent assertion that our economy has become a service economy rather than an economy which concentrates on the production of goods. The basis of this assertion is the fact that more than half of the working population is now employed in rendering services rather than in directly producing goods. This service economy argument against the focus on wealth is superficial, I believe, for the following reason. Not only are agriculture, mining, construction, and manufacturing all engaged in the production of goods, but also all of the so-called service industries center on goods. <coughs> retailing and wholesaling, service industries, are the retailing and wholesaling of goods. Cleaning, repair, and maintenance services are the cleaning, repair, and maintenance of goods. Transportation and communications are largely transportation of and communications concerning goods. Banking, finance, insurance, and advertising are services performed overwhelmingly in connection with facilitating the production, distribution, or ownership of goods. Those services <coughs> that are performed not as auxiliaries to the production, distribution, or ownership of goods Services such as passenger airline travel for vacationers, personal communications, personal medical, legal, or grooming services vitally depend on the use of goods in their rendition. There could be no passenger airline travel without airplanes and airports, no telephone service without telephones and telephone exchanges, and so on. But what makes the rendition of personal services fall within the sphere of economics is the fact that the providers of such services render them for the purpose of acquiring wealth. As I showed at one of the TJS conferences, in a division of labor society, this refers to the rendition of such services for the purpose of earning money. <clears throat> Thus, the services of personal physicians, personal attorneys, barbers, and the like come within the sphere of economics insofar as they are performed for money which is the means by which these parties obtain wealth in a division of labor society. <coughs> now, it is true, of course, that there could be no wealth without the rendition of services, above all, without the performance of labor. 
the performance of labor is an essential prerequisite to the production of all wealth. Although economics uh, is concerned with services, it is so only insofar as they are necessary to the production, enjoyment, or acquisition of wealth, or depend on the use of wealth. Economics is not at all concerned with the rendition of services apart from their connection with wealth. For example, when two people hold an interesting conversation, they are rendering a service to each other. But economics is not concerned with activities of this nature, except insofar as they can be connected with wealth. It could be argued that the direct exchange of services for services also sometimes falls within the sphere of economics. For example, an exchange of French lessons for mathematics lessons, in which the rendition of each service is performed as the conscious, explicitly agreed upon requirement of receiving the other. Even in such cases, what brings the rendition of the service within the purview of economics is ultimately a connection to wealth. This is so because what makes exchange itself a vital economic phenomenon, central to the studies of economics, is the fact that in a division of labor society, the production and enjoyment of wealth requires exchange on a massive scale as the means of bringing goods from their producers to their consumers. In the absence of a division of labor in the production of wealth, exchange would be a relatively infrequent and unimportant phenomenon. It is only the fact that the production of wealth takes place under a division of labor, which makes exchange the vital economic phenomenon it is, and thus entails consideration of the exchange of services for services as falling within the domain of economics. The second challenge to economics focus on wealth is the mistaken claim that economics is a science of choices rather than a science of wealth. A science which, uh, as many textbooks describe it, studies, quote, the allocation of scarce means among competing ends, unquote. This contention rests on a logical fallacy. It does not see that what gives rise to economic study of choices and its concern with the allocation of scarce means among competing ends is the fact that people have a virtually limitless need for wealth, but only a limited capacity for satisfying that need at any given time. Thus, people must choose which aspects of their need for wealth are to be satisfied and which are not. Economic studies the determinants of human choice only insofar as they concern choices of how to spend incomes that are of necessity limited and only insofar as they affect the attraction of capital and labor to the production of some goods rather than other goods. In other words, it studies the issue of choices for no other reason than that it is necessary to do so as part of its study of the production of wealth under a system of division of labor. To claim that economics is on this account a science of human choices rather than of wealth is to confuse an aspect of the science with its totality. To adopt this view is to be led to ignore all the really crucial matters that economics deals with and to seek esoteric extensions of the subject that have nothing whatever to do with its, with its actual nature. I turn now to the proposition that man's need for wealth has no practical limit. The basis for this proposition is the fact that man possesses the faculty of reason. The possession of this faculty radically enlarges both the scope of man's needs and capacities in comparison with those of any other living entity, and at the same time makes possible continuous improvement in the satisfaction of his needs and in the exercise of his capacities. <coughs> Considered abstractly, man's possession of reason gives him the potential for a limitless range of knowledge and awareness, and thus for a limitless range of action and experience. Man's mind can grasp the existence both of subatomic particles and of galaxies and of everything in between. It observes all manner of patterns and of similarities and differences of which no other form of consciousness is capable. 
Thus, the potential is created for man to act over a range extending from the subatomic level to the remotest reaches of outer space and to experience all that his mind enables him to discern and enjoy in the totality of the universe. Material goods, wealth, are the physical means both of acting in the world, for example, automobiles and airplanes, tools and machines of all kinds, and of enjoying the experiences of which man is capable. For example, in addition to many of the goods in the preceding category, works of art and sculpture, landscape grounds and gardens, uh, beautiful homes and furniture. They are the instrumentalities of man's action and objects of his contemplation, that is, the goods that constitute wealth. The potential of a limitless range of action and experience implies a limitless need for wealth as the means of achieving this potential. Man needs wealth without limit if he is to fulfill his limitless potential as a rational being in physical reality. This abstract principle can be illustrated in a wide variety of forms, starting with the contribution of additional wealth to the improved satisfaction of man's elementary needs for nutrition and health. Because man possesses reason and is thus able to abstract, form concepts, and think conceptually, his mind is able to grasp connections spanning generations and continents between his material well-being and the physical state of the world. Thus, for man, functioning on the conceptual level, the satisfaction just of the needs for nutrition and health implies a practically limitless need and desire for wealth in the form of canning and freezing facilities, a modern transportation and communications system, a farm equipment industry, and everything that is necessary to the existence of these things, such as the steel, oil, and coal industries, the transportation and communications equipment industries, and so on. All such wealth is necessary to, uh, to an adequate quantity and sufficient variety of food to meet man's nutritional needs. Likewise, man's need for health further implies a need not only for medicines, hospitals, and all manner of diagnostic and therapeutic equipment, and everything necessary to their existence, but extends even to such seemingly unrelated things as automobiles and space travel. The former made possible the ability of people to live in the fresh air of the suburbs, and also the modern ambulance. The latter holds out such things as the possibility of recuperation from heart disease in, a re in an environment of reduced gravity. Reason gives to man the ability to use wealth progressively to enhance the exercise of the capacities he shares in common with lesser species. For example, man shares with animals the capacity for locomotion. Animals can do no better than rely on their unaided legs. Man domesticates the horse, the elephant, and the camel. He produces shoes and builds roads, rafts, and sailing vessels. He goes further and invents the railroad, the steamship, and the automobile, and then the airplane and the rocket ship. Similarly, man shares with the animals the capacity to see and hear. Animals can do no more than rely on their unaided eyes and ears. But man produces telescopes, microscopes, and stethoscopes, television sets and radios, x-ray machines and phonographs, eyeglasses and hearing aids, motion pictures and tape recorders. As noted, the fact that man is the rational being also gives him a wider range of capacities than is possessed by any of the lesser species. Because man is the rational being, he is able to pursue such activities as music, art, science, and athletics. He is able to form relationships with others which are maintained even though the parties may be separated by great distances and for long intervals of time. It is the nature of man's brain that enables him to integrate separate sounds into harmonies and melodies, to grasp representations and thus the meaning of a painting, to pursue science, to follow the system of rules of a game of sport, and to maintain an awareness of others from whom he is separated by time and distance. These are feats of which an animal's brain is incapable. In the pursuit of all of these additional activities, made possible by the possession of reason, wealth 
is either absolutely indispensable or, at a minimum, enormously contributes to the performance and enjoyment of the activity. Wealth contributes to music when it takes the form of musical instruments, music books and scores, concert halls and conservatories, radios, phonographs, and tape recorders. <clears throat> if music were deprived of the existence of these forms of wealth, the activity would be reduced to the unaided, untrained, and largely unheard singing of the human voice. In the absence of wealth in the form of brushes, paints, and canvases, of museums, schools, and books of art, well, uh, art would be reduced to primitive drawings on the walls of caves, if even that. In the absence of wealth in the form of scientific equipment, laboratories, universities, and libraries, science could not be pursued. In the absence of wealth in the form of playing fields, athletic equipment, stadiums, and radio and television sets, Athletic events and the enjoyment derived from them would suffer a radical decline. <clears throat> in the absence of wealth in the form of pens and paper, post offices, telephones, automobiles, railroad ships and planes, friendships and other human relationships could not be maintained <clears throat> over long distances. On the basis of these observations, <clears throat> it is obvious that the ancient prejudice that man's desire for wealth serves his lower needs is absurd. Wealth is the material means of carrying on virtually every human activity and of serving virtually all of man's needs. It is man's means of acting in accordance with his human potential. Moreover, even the wealth that does serve man's lower needs, in quotes, such as presumably his needs for nutrition and elimination, also reflects his, need, his nature as a rational being in ways beyond those already described. When man serves his lower needs, he does so in a manner that is unique to him, in a manner that reflects the distinctive nature of his consciousness. For example, when man eats, he does not do so in the manner of an animal, indifferent to its surroundings. On the contrary, he desires such things as tables and chairs, table linen, china, silverware, and so on. He is also highly sensitive to the preparation of his food and to the combinations in which it is served. When man eliminates, he desires the existence of such things as indoor plumbing and privacy. In such activities, <clears throat> the nature of man's consciousness requires the incorporation of aesthetic psychological elements into the satisfaction of what in animals are merely physical needs. For man, <clears throat> at least in his waking hours, there is probably no such thing as a purely physical need. Man's physical needs are intimately connected with his psychology as a rational being, as a being aware of such things as patterns and harmonies and dissonances in shapes, sounds, and colors, and possessing the need to organize his activities and control the functions of his body. In everything he does, man can be aware of his own emotional responses, and can distinguish between aesthetic elements which enable him to have a more enjoyable or a less enjoyable emotional response. Thus, the aesthetic element enters into the satisfaction of virtually all of man's needs. It leads him to desire not just clothing and shelter, but clothing and shelter with style and beauty. It leads him to desire not just transportation, but automobiles with chrome trim and white wall tires. Matters of design and appearance feature prominently in all consumers' goods where men are free to choose. <clears throat> Closely related to man's need for aesthetic satisfaction is his need for novelty and variety, which also emanates from the rational nature of his consciousness. The lower animals do not become bored with the repetition of the same routine. Man does. The nature of man's consciousness enables him to appreciate the differences of a, to appreciate differences of a kind of which animals show no apparent awareness, and seems to require that he periodically experience such differences. Thus, whereas animals are content to eat the same food day in and day out, man requires a variety of food. Man experiences a sense of intellectual refreshment when he breaks his routine and takes a vacation or a weekend off. He also experiences a sense of intellectual refreshment 
in the introduction and possession of new goods and with the coming of style changes. Thus, the appearance of almost every new gadget is an occasion for a kind of excitement. It is a thrill for a rational consciousness to see such new products appear, each in its day, as automobiles, airplanes, refrigerators, radios, television sets, pocket calculators, computers, and so on. The purchase of such goods is almost always an occasion for special pleasure because it provides something new and valuable to experience. Even the replacement purchases of such goods are usually a source of pleasure because further improvements have usually been made in them and because of style changes. Changes in style, whether in automobiles, clothing, or furniture, are a source of intellectual refreshment and pleasure because they provide a sense of the new and different. It must be stressed that man's desire for novelty and variety stands in the service of his life. The principle is very similar to that of the pursuit of scientific knowledge, where the motive is curiosity, and the effect is all manner of practical applications that could not have been foreseen in advance. In just this way, people originally desired automobiles, not as a practical means of transportation, but as an object of amusement. Yet this desire led to the growth of the automobile industry and to the transformation of the economic system. A similar course of development occurred in the case of electric light and power and telephones and television sets, and now seems to be underway in the case of home and personal computers. Even if no practical applications ever result directly from the things desired, their being desired produces practical results. For example, a great industrialist motive in earning additional millions to pile on top of those he already has may be merely to add to his collection of fine paintings and statues. But in pursuing this motive, the industrialist is led to introduce products and methods of production that enable the average person to obtain such things as more and better food, clothing, and transportation. Man's life gains incalculably from the fact that his activities are not limited to the practical, but are undertaken largely for the sheer pleasure of experiencing the new and different, and the corresponding expansion of his own powers required to accomplish it. For this leads him to do things that have practical results which it would otherwise be impossible for him to obtain. In effect, reason serves man's life in being free to serve itself. Although man's life may not need every particular object of his desire for novelty and variety, it very much does need the existence of his desire for novelty and variety. On the basis of the existence of an objectively limitless need for wealth, there is no limit to man's desire for wealth. The occasional cases that exist of individuals in whom the desire for additional wealth is totally repressed are comparable in their frequency and significance to the cases of individuals in whom sexual desire is totally repressed. These cases are rare indeed. Even medieval monks, for example, thoroughly committed to the doctrine of asceticism, were torn by the temptation for material things. The truth lies with Adam Smith, who observed, quote, the desire of food is limited in every man by the narrow capacity of the human stomach, but the desire of the conveniences and ornaments of building, dress, equipage, and household furniture seems to have no limit or certain boundary." Unquote. To translate Smith's observation into contemporary terms, we can observe as the overwhelming norm such things as that the man who has no automobile would like to be able to afford one. The man who has an automobile would like to be able to afford a newer, better one. The man who has one or more new automobiles of the highest quality would like to be able to afford a yacht or a plane. If he is rich enough to afford both a yacht and a plane, then he would like to be able to afford a yacht on which the plane can land. <laughs> uh, the more one has, the more one wants. The fact that both the need and the desire for additional wealth are limitless for all practical purposes does not mean, however, that people automatically act to satisfy that need and desire. 
it is certainly possible for the need and desire for additional wealth to fail to result in the production of additional wealth, let alone in continuous economic progress. Indeed, history and most of the world around us are characterized by stagnation and poverty. The mere possession of a need or desire is never sufficient to ensure that the need or desire will be satisfied. In the absence of a rational philosophy establishing limited government and economic freedom and inculcating such convictions as that the material world has both reality and primacy, that it is intelligible and that hard work pays, man is not able to devote himself sufficiently to the production of wealth. In such conditions, man desires more wealth than he possesses, but his desire is not strong enough or consistent enough to enable him actually to go and to produce additional wealth. And if it is strong enough to induce him to increase his production, he is again, he is again and again stopped from doing so because of the initiation of physical force by others. Even when the barrier of physical force temporarily relaxes, and some individuals are able to make some improvements. The absence of a rational philosophy precludes the development of science. It also precludes the establishment of sufficient freedom to make possible the development of the division of labor and the other capitalistic institutions necessary to the continuous increase in the production of wealth. As a result, despite the existence of both a need and a desire for additional wealth on the part of those affected, we witness such phenomena as masses of people dying of starvation, yet unable, indeed sometimes even unwilling, to expend the effort to produce additional food. We witness primitive people delighted with the gift of mirrors and trinkets of all kinds, not to mention transistor radios and bicycles, yet willing to go on living under essentially the same conditions as their remotest ancestors. The fact that the need and desire for wealth are limitless does not mean that when people devote themselves to satisfying that need and desire, as in the nations of modern capitalism, they go through life with a sense of endless frustration, seeking more than they can ever hope to obtain. The normal man, if he lacks an automobile, does not actively desire a yacht. He actively desires merely an automobile. His desire for a yacht lies dormant until such time as he has already acquired one or more high-quality automobiles. The limitless desire for wealth, in other words, becomes active only step by step. It manifests itself in an active desire for things that are merely one or two steps beyond our reach at the moment. It leads us to exert ourselves and extend our reach, and then, as we succeed, desires previously dormant become active or totally new desires are formed, and we are led to exert ourselves and extend our reach further. Thus, the limitless desire for wealth impels us steadily to advance. Oriental philosophy and some schools of thought in the contemporary Western world claim that the fact that our desires will always be a step ahead of our possessions shows the futility of our efforts that instead we should seek to rid ourselves of our desires and be content forever with some minimum of wealth. Such teachings are utterly mistaken and their influence helps to account for the stagnation and poverty that exist in the world. They view the excess of our desires over our possessions as a source of discontent and unhappiness. Actually, this excess is the root of our ambitiousness and are rising to meet new challenges. It is what impels us to progress and as such is an essential element of our happiness. It should be realized that as rational beings we are also progressive beings. Progress is the corollary of the continuous application of reason. Any individual who continues to use reason, who continues to think, necessarily comes to know more and more and thus to be, able to, uh, to, to be able to accomplish more and more. If a society is characterized by continuous thinking from generation to generation, and if its educational system works, that is, if it succeeds in transmitting to the rising generation the essentials of the knowledge discovered by all the preceding generations, then the general body of knowledge in the society is progressive 
and thus the society as a whole is capable of accomplishing more and more. <clears throat> Progress is the natural result of the use of reason as a constant. If our happiness depends on living in accordance with our nature as rational beings, then our happiness and progress are inseparably connected. The fact that our desires will always be ahead of our ability to satisfy them is not a cause of unhappiness. It is the inducement to the steady exercise of our reason, to our living in accordance with our nature, which is indispensable to our happiness. Our happiness does not come from the existence of desires satisfied, but from the steady upward climb itself, from the process of continuing to think and solve problems and to become capable of accomplishing more and more. In other words, progress is a source of happiness. In the lives of scientists, inventors, businessmen, engineers, and managers, progress is the obvious focal point of thinking, planning, and problem solving. It is also what necessitates that the average worker make himself capable of continuing to think and learn throughout his life so that he can acquire new, the new skills necessary to adapt to the changing requirements of production. Progress is what helps to elevate even the average man of modern Western civilization into a thinking literate being possessing an intellectual life incomparably superior to that of previous eras. If happiness depends on the possession of a sound, active mind, progress fosters happiness. A further aspect of the connection between progress, reason, and happiness must be mentioned. As rational beings, we are able to be aware of the future. The future has reality for us in the present. To be able to look forward to a better future enables us to bear considerable hardship in the present without complaint, even cheerfully. But to look forward to a future of unrelieved hardship, or worse, a future that holds out the prospect of even greater hardship, makes hardship in the present more difficult, if not impossible to bear. Indeed, the prospect of impoverishment in the future deprives one of the ability to derive pleasure even from the possession of substantial wealth in the present, because the shadow of such a future must hang over whatever enjoyment might, one might have in the present. Thus, the prospect of progress, as well as the process of achieving it, contributes to our happiness. I turn now to the objective nature of economic progress and to a critique of the doctrines of cultural relativism and conspicuous consumption. According to these widely held doctrines, the concept of economic progress can have no objective meaning. These doctrines hold, for example, that our preference for automobiles over horses or for radios and television sets over jungle tom-toms is a matter of, of social and cultural conditioning. It is allegedly the result only of the fact that in this particular culture it happens to have been instilled in people for no really good reason that it is desirable to own such goods as automobiles and television sets. Accordingly, people supposedly want to own such goods not because it is really desirable to own them in any objective sense, but merely that they may conform to what is expected of them in this culture. They allegedly want to own them as a source of prestige in the eyes of others. The essential meaning of these doctrines can be grasped by realizing that what they imply is that people want to own television sets not because they want to watch the television sets, but because they want to be seen watching them. <coughs> not the actual consumption of goods is important, we are told, but the conspicuousness of their consumption. Thus, the only real significance of television sets or, or any of the other gadgets of capitalist society is supposed to be their significance in the eyes of others. In a different culture, people allegedly derive equal satisfaction from appearing before others with a ring through their nose. And in the society of the future, or at least as many people conceive the future until very recently, they will allegedly do so by wearing a chest full of medals, proclaiming them as heroes of socialist labor. Thus, according to these doctrines, there is no reason to believe that people's preferences in a modern capitalist society 
are any better grounded than those of people in any other type of society, or that a modern capitalist society is in any objective sense superior to any other society. There is thus allegedly no basis for believing that what has been accomplished in a modern capitalist society is in any objective sense progress. <coughs> Now what is wrong with these doctrines is that they omit any consideration of man in relation to the physical world. For them, the most important thing in human life is the mere approval or disapproval of other people, which is thought to constitute an ultimate standard incapable of being subjected to further evaluation. But the truth is, of course, that the primary issue in human life is man's relationship to the physical world. It is there and there alone that man must live or die irrespective of the culture in which he lives. And how man succeeds in relation to the physical world provides an objective standard by which to judge the value of cultures. The examples of automobiles and television sets can serve to illustrate this point. <clears throat> it is not true that our preference for the automobile over the horse is arbitrary, based on nothing more than social and cultural conditioning. It is based on our nature, both as animate beings possessing the, ca the capacity of locomotion and as rational beings capable of enlarging all of our physical capacities. We call the automobile an advance over the horse by the same standard by which we call the domestication of the horse an advance over possessing merely our unaided legs and by the same standard by which we value the possession of our legs themselves. Namely, it extends the range and our range and power of locomotion. If the automobile were not an advance over the horse, then the horse would not be an advance over our unaided legs. And on the basis of such reasoning, the very possession of legs themselves could not be considered better than not possessing them. The automobile is an advance over the horse, therefore, for the same reason that it is better to have legs than not to have them. Similarly, we call the telegraph an advance over the tom-tom and radio an advance over the telegraph because they increase the efficacy of our sense of hearing. The one enables us to hear sounds coming from a greater distance, the other sounds from a greater distance as well as a greater range of sound. Thus, we value the radio over the telegraph and the telegraph over the tom-tom by the same standard as we value our sense of hearing itself. We call television an advance over radio for the same reason that we value the possession of eyes and ears together over the possession of ears alone. We call color television an advance over black and white for the same reason that we value normal vision over being colorblind. The advances in our goods represent extensions of our power to use our limbs, senses, and minds to accomplish results. In effect, they magnify the power of these vital attributes of our persons. They are advances by the standard of the value of these attributes, and thus by the standard of the value of our persons. Needless to say, I'm indebted to Ayn Rand both for the general concept of an objective code of values based on man's life as the standard, and for the special application of that concept in the form of some goods being classified as being of greater philosophically objective value than others. It may be that there are cultures in which people regularly grow up incapable of appreciating the value of economic advances. It may be that in this culture there are some people who really do not understand what our advances are all about and who see no better reason for valuing them than that of conforming to the expectations of others. <clears throat> the existence of such people and such cultures proves not that our advances are not advances, but only that there are people with a gross deficiency of understanding and cultures that are highly destructive of our capacity for understanding of the capacity for understanding. This discussion has major bearing on the fact that in American society, the objective fact underlying such prestige is that the earning of wealth benefits one's life by enabling one to do more. Thus, it deserves to bring prestige by the standard of human life as a value. It is a great tribute to the that it is that it has accorded prestige. It must also be pointed out that the attempt to reverse cause and effect 
and to take prestige as the starting point must backfire. For example, the attempt of a socialist society to induce work by the offer of prestige rather than material incentives not only cannot succeed, but must bring the opposite of prestige to those who would be willing to work for it. <clears throat> to mine coal, drive a truck, harvest a field, work in a factory, to do virtually any of the run-of-the-mill jobs that occupy the bulk of the labor force for the sake of prestige would be to mark a person as nothing but a fool. He would have to be a fool to drive himself day in and day out, sweating and straining, all for the sake of nothing more than, in effect, being called a good boy. The objective superiority of the goods of modern capitalism is not called into question by the fact that in our culture, many people want to own such goods as horses, canoes, bows and arrows, and so on, and in some cases prefer units of these goods to units of more advanced goods serving the same needs. Such choices do not by any means necessarily mark these people as primitivists. There are conditions in which the horse is superior to the automobile, for example, where there are no roads. <clears throat> Similarly, canoes can navigate shallow waters that motorized craft cannot. <clears throat> also, the physical experience that a horse or canoe affords is different from that provided by an automobile or motorboat. They enable one to observe things more closely and more leisurely, for example. The desire to own such goods, even though one lives in the conditions of modern civilization, is actually nothing more than a manifestation of our limitless need for wealth. A person wants one or more automobiles as his normal means of transportation, and a horse as a further refinement, as it were, of his ability to locomote. <clears throat> Thus, he loads his horse into a horse trailer, hitches it to his car or better motor home, and drives to the edge of terrain where only horses can go. <clears throat> or he simply goes for a ride on a nearby trail to enjoy the, the motion of a gallop, the experience of the motion of a gallop and the wind on his face. To be able to enjoy the widest possible range of pleasurable and beneficial experiences is precisely why an individual desires to obtain the greatest possible amount of wealth. But to obtain it and have time to enjoy it, he must be able to accomplish everything that is not itself pleasure or otherwise valued for its own sake in the shortest possible time. If, for example, what a person wants is the experience of leisurely riding along a beautiful mountain stream on horseback, then he doesn't want to waste that time using a horse to cross the country to get to the mountains. For that, he wants a motor vehicle together with roads. Uh, it, uh, together with roads, is objectively superior to the horse as a normal means of transportation. As a direct source of enjoyment, however, there is still a need for horses even in the conditions of a modern economy. In effect, the limitless need for wealth embraces a kind of recapitulation of the goods that were prominent in less advanced conditions. I've shown that economic progress is not a matter of arbitrary preference, but is objectively desirable, desirable on the basis of our nature as rational beings. The goods that result are objectively improvements, and the process of acquiring them the continuous thinking that must be done is called for by our nature as rational beings. The objective value of economic progress <clears throat> implies that the cultural values that make economic progress possible are likewise objectively better than those that stand in its way. These values, of course, are the values that underlie the division of labor and capitalism. Above all, reason, science, technology, individual rights, limited government and economic freedom and private ownership of the means of production. In the name of being able to see, hear, move, or do anything that our senses, limbs, and minds enable us to do, in short, in the name of being able to live as human beings, these values deserve to be upheld. Indeed, the same principle that establishes the objectivity of the economic advances of modern capitalism directly establishes the objectivity of the superiority of modern capitalist civilization as such in comparison with any other form of civilization. Here, the attribute that serves as the standard is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge. Modern capitalist civilization, modern Western civilization, possesses this ability in greater measure than any previous civilization. 
in addition to knowledge of the laws of logic and the principle of causality, which were known to the Greeks and Romans, and which enabled them to surpass all previous civilizations in the ability to acquire knowledge, modern Western civilization possesses not only a much more highly developed knowledge of the laws of mathematics and science, but also a division of labor economy, and above all, in its Anglo-Saxon variant, the freedoms of speech and press. A division of labor economy makes possible an enormous and progressive increase in the amount of knowledge that a society possesses and in the application of knowledge to production. The freedoms of speech and press also play an essential role in the increase in knowledge by guaranteeing the individual's right to disseminate knowledge without being stopped by the coercive power of the state operating in support of the ignorance, fears, or superstitions of any individual or group. Thus, capitalist civilization deserves to be upheld in the name of the value of knowledge. For further details, I refer you to my article, Education and the Racist Road to Barbarism. Well, in summation, this morning I've explained the nature of wealth and goods and showed why economics is, as the classical economists maintained, a science of wealth. I demonstrated the existence of a human need and corresponding desire for wealth that for all practical purposes is unlimited inasmuch as it is based on man's possession of reason. I showed that the possession of reason in creating the potential for a virtually limitless range of knowledge and awareness and thus of action and experience creates the basis for a limitless need for wealth as the material means of acting and experiencing. I showed that wealth without practical limit is necessary to serve the entire scope of human needs and capacities, and to do so in ever improved ways, and that the desire for wealth without limit is what impels us toward progress. I showed that progress is natural to man the rational being in that it is the result of his use of reason as a constant. That is, it is the result that follows from the transmission of knowledge from generation to generation and the contribution of fresh thinking by succeeding generations. I showed that the process of economic progress is an important source of human happiness. I demonstrated the objective nature of economic progress based on an objective standard for judging advances in goods. I also demonstrated the objective superiority of a division of labor capitalist society, both as the source of objectively more advanced goods and by the standard of the ability to acquire and apply knowledge. I hope that in the question period, I will have the opportunity of showing why the process of increasing production is not limited by any inherent lack of natural resources, that indeed the same process that steadily increases the production of goods just as steadily increases the supply of usable, accessible natural resources. I also hope that I'll have the opportunity of developing some of the implications of the existence of a limitless need and desire for wealth for such matters as the cause of mass unemployment. Well, I thank you very much, and I hope in the question period that I will get questions on the subject of the lecture. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I'm not going to give any questions. I still need some clarification. Is, is this on the subject of the lecture? Yes. Okay. I still need some clarification on one thing. In your, in your discussion on the limitless need for wealth, mm -hmm. you touched in many cases on how the human mind and how the pursuit of wealth and the things that wealth help satisfy certain needs of the human mind. Mm -hmm. For example, variety of life. A person who is a religious ascetic might say, well, that doesn't matter because you pursue life after death. I don't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm trying to sort out is a social ascetic who would say, the true happiness is not through the thrill you get from the latest gadgets, which I can certainly say I guess, mm -hmm. but it's through human relationships, and therefore you should really be pursuing uh, service to mankind. And I wonder if you could address that. It's not a real question exactly. But I heard say uh, that there are people who will say 
that true happiness uh, comes through service to mankind, by which is really meant sacrifice uh, to mankind. Well, what they're claiming is that somehow true happiness comes from doing something which is making you unhappy. Because when you are sacrificing, what that means is you are giving up something that you value for the sake of something you don't value, or something you value more for the sake of something you value less. And it is utterly impossible that that could make you happy. And if you wanted to seriously apply that, if I, you could push it a step further and say, well, if uh, true happiness comes from sacrifice, and you're telling me uh, that that's how I will make myself happy, well, I will sacrifice your doctrine and proceed to be happy that way. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> What do you have in mind? Uh, I, I'm talking about things, yeah? Well, a good view. A good view. Well, uh, to have access to a good view uh, certainly does require effort. Uh, you have to get there. If you want to see it every day, you have to build your house there. So uh, to obtain this benefit, you see, something, a, a free good is something that just comes to us automatically as a normal condition of life. Uh, we breathe without conscious effort. Uh, by the nature of the atmosphere, we have the air, uh, we have sunlight, whatever. Now then there are conditions in which uh, these things have to be created. Like if you're in a submarine, then you have to provide for the air to breathe or in a high altitude airplane. So things that are normally free goods in, in certain circumstances uh, become economic goods. The gentleman over here. How is the decision made uh, as to whether uh, something which has a variety of possible uses, such as uh, providing a nice scenic view or uh, being a copper mine or whatever, how is it decided uh, which of a variety of possible uses uh, any given piece of property is devoted to? Well, the answer in a capitalist society is that is decided by which is the most profitable use. Uh, to take a common example, uh, very applicable in recent years in Southern California. Uh, there is land down here that a couple of generations back uh, was farms and ranches, and now it's uh, the site of uh, residential and commercial uses. Now, what decides whether uh, the owner of a given piece of land will continue to use it as a farm or ranch or uh, have it subdivided? Well, it's which use pays the most. Now, if we have a situation where a piece of land brings in every year, let's imagine $100,000 if it's used for agricultural purposes, and on that basis, let's say the land is worth a million dollars, or uh, that same land could be divided up into building sites for 1,000 homes, each of, which, uh, would, uh, uh, each of which land site would also be worth uh, $100,000, then which is the more valuable use of the land? Well, obviously the latter. Now here we are, we have a condition, there are a thousand people each wanting homes. They're willing to pay such and so much to be able to use that land as home sites. Then there are the buyers of agricultural produce who uh, are willing to allow such and so much in the price of the produce, and the one out competes the other. Now part of the reason that that happens is there is other land which can produce the agricultural produce almost as well, and we continue to have the agricultural produce plus get the special site value of the land. Now, in the case of, uh, of, of a mining operation, it would be essentially the same thing. 
if there is something of special scenic beauty uh, that people are willing to pay some special premium for, and there are enough of them, or if uh, their enjoyment of the location as a scenic site is consistent with its use as a mining operation, provided the mining operation is disguised in some way, and if special steps are taken so it doesn't appear uh, as an obvious mining operation, well, the market will provide it. So it's a question, you see, in the price system operates uh, to array all of the different possible uses of any individual piece of land against one another in a competition that's carried on uh, by the buyers of all of the different ultimate products. And that, that represents the most profitable use to the owner of the land, and that's how he uses it. Uh, yes, Ms. Hill. Mrs. Hill. Well, the idea of going back to nature in the sense, the, the question is, what do I have to say? Did you pick up the question? Okay, all right. The question is, what do I have to say to people who advocate going back to nature and who blame uh, capitalism for all of the uh, world's woes? In the sense in which they mean going back to nature, and they really mean it, they mean uh, uh, returning to the... Uh, to the way of life of our Stone Age ancestors. You can actually hear, hear people uh, say that uh, the North American Indians and the Australian Aborigines were better adapted to their environment than we are on the absurd grounds that their uh, culture did not depend on mining operations and was thus uh, continual, continuable because they could uh, con continually replace whatever they were using up while because ours depends on mining operations, it must end. Well, what I would say is going back to nature means that uh, the overwhelming majority of us now alive would die. Uh, whoever managed to survive, a very small handful of people, would be living in the conditions of the most brutish poverty. And I would say uh, to those who wish to do that, feel free, buy yourself a piece of ground somewhere and live as animals. But uh, you're not going to force the rest of the world. And as for the problems, the problems of the world exist in those areas, those countries, which have not adopted capitalism. And the problems in the countries that have adopted capitalism exist to the extent that they have been inconsistent in its adoption and are uh, hampering its operation through government intervention. This gentleman over here. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the prevailing belief is that the connection between production and natural resources is that production simply uses up a scarce, precious stock of natural resources that nature has given us, and that sooner or later we must run out. Now, this uh, notion, on the one, from one perspective, uh, enormously understates what nature has provided, and from a different perspective, enormously overstates it. What nature has actually provided is matter in all of its elemental forms and energy. And what that amounts to, if these are, in one sense, this represents natural resources. Uh, what I say in The Government Against the Economy and in the other book <laughs> is from the upper limits of the atmosphere down to the core of the earth, there is nothing but solidly packed chemical elements. All of this is natural resources. There is all kinds of incredible energy in thunderstorms, uh, the, the oceans, every static electricity. Every planetary body in the universe represents solidly packed natural resources. All of the stars and whatever else there may be represents energy. For practical purposes, uh, nature's contribution to natural resources can be regarded as infinite. From a narrower perspective of what are we as human beings able to do with what nature provides, 
what uses can we put what nature provides? What, what uses can we devote nature's contribution to? Nature provides uh, just about nothing at all. The basic problem with respect to natural resources is to figure out how to make what nature has provided uh, usable and accessible, how to put it to our purposes and to do so without expending very much labor. And the solution to this problem is science, technology, and improving capital equipment. The real issue of natural resources is as we gain more scientific and technological knowledge and improve capital equipment, we continually enlarge the fraction of what nature has provided that we can devote to our purposes. We are progressively enlarging the supply of usable, accessible natural resources as we go along. Uh, back in the days when iron could only be mined by people working with picks and shovels, the supply of usable, accessible iron ore was correspondingly limited. Today, when you can mine iron ore with people scooping it out in multi-ton loads with bulldozers, and we're able to have chemical reduction processes on combinations of iron and other elements that we couldn't have before, we have far more accessible, uh, usable iron ore than ever before. Uh, when it was, uh, when not only did petroleum first have to be discovered as having beneficial properties before it could be a natural resource at all, but the supply of usable, accessible petroleum was increased when Rockefeller put scientists to work to figure out how to crack petroleum molecules to get rid of the sulfur. Uh, every improvement in, dr in drilling uh, equipment so that we can go down deeper, that represents an increase in the supply of usable, accessible petroleum. If we could make uh, the exploitation of shale commercially feasible, uh, we'd have a tenfold increase in pet usable, accessible petroleum reserves. If we solve the problem of commercially feasible hydrogen fusion, well, hydrogen is the most abundant uh, element in the universe. The basic point is we create the usability and accessibility of what nature has provided by virtue of enlarging our knowledge of science and technology. So we started out, our ancestors could uh, usefully exploit virtually zero of what nature provided. Now today, we perhaps are up to the level of being able to exploit 0. .000 on out uh, quite a distance, one of what nature provides. And we're just at the very beginning of this process. We're only literally scratching the surface of the Earth. The radius of the Earth is 4,000 miles. The deepest mining operations go down maybe one or two miles. We're just reaching the point now of being able to conduct undersea mining operations. The oceans cover 70% of the surface of the world. If the environmentalists don't stop us, we're just at the very beginning of being able to exploit uh, the close to the surface natural resources of the Earth. So uh, from that perspective, there is no problem. We create, we create the goods character. At each new advance that makes it possible to exploit these resources without too much labor, that lends goods character to the resource and makes it a particle of wealth. Um, sulfurous uh, petroleum deposits were not wealth until Standard Oil figured out how to uh, make them commercially usable, then they became wealth. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, right. What are the, uh, the implications for the desirability of wealth vis-a-vis from employment or mass amount? Okay, well, if it's correct that there is no limit to our need and desire for wealth, this means that uh, no depression in history has ever been caused by an ability to produce in excess of our need and desire for wealth. Uh, no labor-saving improvement can ever render production excessive. Production can never be excessive. Some entirely different explanation of unemployment is necessary. It's not that we're ever able to produce too much. And the explanation of unemployment is the, simply the fact that uh, a, a relationship is established between the prices of things on the one side and the uh, ability of people to spend money on the other, which makes it impossible uh, to buy all of the goods. Prices are too high. Prices and wage rates are too high relative to the uh, quantity of money and ability to spend money. So let's just think of it this way. How much would you like to be able to buy with the income you're earning? 
let's suppose here we are in the whole economy we have a certain limited amount of ability to spend money let's say five trillion dollars a year well how much would we all like to be able to buy each of us for our own share of that five trillion <clears throat> an awful lot more than we are buying. all right what is it that limits how much we can buy with that money it's the prices well as we increase production, the, uh, it would be possible, even, with, even if there were only the same money, there would be no limit to what we could buy, provided prices fell. If there are people who are unemployed, there's no limit to the number of people who can be employed, provided wage rates are sufficiently low relative to the total spending to buy goods, uh, to, to, to pay labor. We can have full employment if uh, employers in the whole country only had the capacity to pay four trillion in wages, well, how many workers can be employed for four trillion dollars? It depends only on what the average wage rate is. And what prevents the average wage rate from coming to the point where everyone can be employed with whatever funds are available to pay wages? Well, it can only be such things as minimum wage and pro-union legislation. See, the government uh, imposes legislation which forces wage rates above uh, the market level. And this situation becomes acute uh, when this is combined with a policy of inflation. When there's inflation for a number of years, uh, people uh, overextend themselves. They, instead of holding money as they should, instead of being liquid, having substantial cash balances, they try to invest every last penny. Uh, they're hoping that, uh, they're expecting their sales to keep rising, to be able to borrow easily. And then what happens when the inflation stops or slows down? Then they scramble, they have to build up their cash holdings, spending drops, and now the reduced amount of spending cannot buy as much as the, the larger spending bought. It could only if wage rates and prices fell. But uh, laws make it illegal for wage rates to fall, so uh, mass unemployment occurs and is perpetuated. It uh, has nothing to do with any limitation of the desire of people for goods. Let me get someone who has, yes, right away. I've got uh, several friends who would consider themselves pro-capitalist, mm -hmm. but it always seems they consider themselves pro-capitalist to a point. Uh, it's more along the lines of, <coughs> I'll express to them that the concept that the earth is a big ball of resources, mm -hmm. that uh, basically our, our capacity to uh, Produce wealth is unlimited. Our desire for wealth is unlimited. Really, the only thing that's limited is our willingness and ability to produce. Right. They'll go along with it <laughs> so far, as long as it's confined to existing areas that are populated or that are industrialized. But how would you address the issue of, say, the vast tracts of land in national forests, uh, national parks, that type of thing? All right, now you're asking, how would I address the issue of all of the tracts of land in national forests and whatever? I would say that uh, the government should not own any of these things. They should immediately be auctioned off. And if they are privately owned, then they will be used in the way that uh, the great majority of people who are working and producing and earning incomes want them to be used. So, uh, for example, if the government did not own uh, all this land area that it sets aside as wildlife preserves and wilderness areas, we'd have a substantially larger supply of oil. Because if you, let's imagine you owned a, a piece of land that has oil on it, you're not going to want to keep it as sagebrush. You'd like to have an oil company come in and develop it. Well, what would be the effect of such developments on the price of oil? It would be much less. We'd have a benefit from that. Uh, the, terrorist regimes in the Middle East as a byproduct would uh, be deprived of revenue. Everyone would live better. Uh, the buyers in the market uh, would be deciding how this land was used. Do you think it's also conceivable that large tracts that are privatized could also remain the way they are, essentially? Well, that would depend on the owners. Now, there are so many people who say they value uh, keeping nature as it is, well, between them, they should be able to put up a lot of their own money, and they could buy a few million acres or several parcels of a few million acres, and if they want to keep it that way, that's just fine with their own property, but not prevent other people from using their property. One of the examples back there uh, talks about 
toxicity of environmentalism. Yeah. You brought up the issue of inherent problem being people perceive, or certain people perceive, an inherent value <coughs> in, in wilderness apart from any meaning to human beings. Right. There are people in the environmental movement, and this is an essential uh, philosophical doctrine of the environmentalists, the doctrine of intrinsic value, the notion that things somehow have value in and of themselves, totally apart from their connection to human life and well-being. And that doctrine is diametrically opposite to what I was presenting uh, in the determination of wealth and goods. Nothing is good from the perspective of a human being that in some way does not contribute to the life or well-being of a human being. Uh, the notion that there is intrinsic value in nature implies that human beings are inherently evil. Uh, what that doctrine claims is there's an intrinsic value uh, in a hillside remaining as a hillside. Now, if we want to develop the hillside, a bulldozer comes in, lops the top of the hill off, from the perspective of the intrinsic value doctrine, this is the destruction of an intrinsic value. We have no right to do that. And the environmentalists hate modern civilization precisely because of its technology and, and ability to accomplish results. We are disturbing the alleged intrinsic values of nature on a scale never before seen. So on that basis, uh, they think that we are uh, the worst evil. From their perspective, uh, you're actually evil every time you put your footprints in the sand. You're disturbing uh, the intrinsic value of the formation of the sand dunes as they were before you. Uh, maybe they're willing to tolerate that if we all went about as quietly and as humbly and inconspicuously as possible. Uh, they might let us live even though we were that sinful. That's their doctrine. Yes, this gentleman here. Uh, following along with that, there's this, this, the whole issue of the uh, Amazon rainforest. And mm -hmm. as some, I, I think that the, the issue has something to do with you know, planning long range and the fact that a person over here in the United States doesn't have a whole lot of control, no matter what they're willing to pay, over how that land is used, and not necessarily some responsible party, rather than the government of, uh, of Brazil that's, that's in charge of that land. And, what, what, is, there, is there any way to deal with, with that you know, rationally? Okay, you're saying, you're uh, referring to what you describe as the Amazon rainforest, which I uh, call the Amazon jungle. Uh, <coughs> and uh, you're saying uh, citizens in the U.S. have no control over how it is used. Uh, well, to an indirect extent, we do. To whatever extent uh, that people are clearing the land to produce things uh, that are sold in the world market, but let's grant that we don't. And in that case, if, if we, that would be our only way of having an influence. And if we don't, we have no standing. Let me point out uh, the stock in trade of the environmentalists is to claim a right for people to intervene in other people's business. Now, the normal standard uh, under the common law is if uh, anyone is doing uh, demonstrable damage or any reasonable basis for thinking he's doing demonstrable damage, to another party, that other party would have the right to go into court and have some action taken, stop the activity, uh, receive a payment. For example, when I was in graduate school, my graduate school was putting up a new building, an adjacent property owner claimed the foundation of her building was being undermined, that had to be worked out. Now, what the environmentalists are doing is not dealing with cases of that kind. They're looking at a case where individuals are working to their own benefit doing no perceptible damage of any kind to anyone else. Let's think of a farmer uh, settling the Midwest. He chops down trees on his parcel of land. He's doing a lot of good to himself. The people he sells to benefit, the people he buys from benefit. Now, when he cuts down the trees, maybe uh, a few extra quarts of water will end up flowing into the Mississippi River. You cannot say that this farmer is causing a flood or anything of that kind. If you could show that, you'd have a basis for stopping him. <clears throat> well, the environmentalists would take a case like that, and now there are millions of such farmers. And let's assume collectively, as a result, the Mississippi floods more often. There is some property damage down in New Orleans. The environmentalists think that this gives them the right to stop the development of the Midwest. Had they been around at that time, that's what they would have been trying to do. What, what about the flooding of New Orleans, the destruction of the buffalo? You can't do this. 
Now, I would say that when some negative byproduct occurs, as the result of millions of people acting separately and independently without any intent, you have to treat the negative byproduct as exactly the same as an act of nature. Nature could make the Mississippi flood. It's not individual human beings. No individual human being should be limited or restricted or controlled in any way for any negative byproduct that can be attributed to the action of the broad class to which he belongs. Such negative outcomes should be simply regarded as acts of nature, and then people be left free to deal with them. So down in New Orleans, they need to build higher dikes or whatever, or maybe abandon some of the land. This applies to global warming. If there is such a thing as global warming, which I don't believe, but if there were, then the, uh, it's not the fault of any individual. We should not attempt to organize the human race, uh, make them stop producing in order to uh, avert this alleged bugaboo. Let it come. Nature produces climate changes. The way to respond is leave each individual free to make the best adjustment he can to the change in conditions. So where different crops are grown will have to be different. Uh, industrial sites may differ somewhat. The essential mechanism for solving the problem is to establish economic freedom so that people can change the locations of their productive establishments where they live and work. It's definitely not uh, to have it in the hands of uh, any government organization. Now I think I've run out of time and I'm a stickler for people staying to their schedules, so I have to apply it to myself. <laughs> so <clears throat> I thank you all very, very much.